First of all, thank you for uh, so much uh, you find the time uh, to speak to our agency Ukraine Forum. You know for sure that uh, right now we have a very cruel uh, war uh, from the Russian side and we are trying to fight for our existence. But for sure that war had some kind of impact for social and economic life of the entire European Union. So how could you assess that kind of influence? Well, first of all, I would like to thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak with you and also with, you, uh, with Ukrainian media and Ukrainian citizens. Because I can assure you that the first day when this horrible war started, on the 24th of February last year, I will never forget this day. Because it was a day of our plenary session in the ESC. And we reacted immediately. We immediately could see that this will change not only in a horrible way the daily lives of Ukrainian people, but it will change the geopolitical context, the whole geopolitical context in Europe, but I would say on a worldwide scale. So therefore we immediately we had a, an open debate among our members strongly condemning this horrible war of aggression of Russia against Ukraine. From this first day on our committee has shown always solidarity and support for Ukraine and for your fight for liberty and freedom. And therefore we continued our support in resolutions but also in concrete actions that we did afterwards. So for example we host uh, a number of civil society organizations, Brussels based or based in Ukraine, here in our committee to give practical support to give Ukrainian civil society uh, a voice also mm. at, at European uh, level and last but not least I think we reacted also as committee to this change in the geopolitical context for example we were the first EU institution that were asking and supporting uh, the candidate status for Ukraine mm. in an un unconditional way which doesn't mean that we uh, think there's a long way to go but I think the political signal was clear from our committee from the first day on and I'm strongly committed to continue this policy. You know uh, perfectly uh, the mood of uh, European public and uh, civil society right now. Uh, till now we have already this war lasting for more than 15 months. Why Europeans still supporting us in this fight as Ukraine is not still European Union member? Well, uh, some people say it's a miracle, somehow. I, I don't believe in miracles. I think the foundation is clearly that European citizens see that Ukraine, civil society in Ukraine and citizens in Ukraine are fighting for the democratic ideal in their country. They are fighting for freedom of civil society. I won't say they fight for European values. First of all, they fight for their own freedom and for their own liberty. And I think this deserves our full support. And the second step, and this I think plays a role, Europeans have recognized, and also governments have recognized, that your fight uh, against the Russian aggression is also a fight that you do on our behalf in the end. And therefore I think uh, civil society, Ukraine civil society, deserves full support from our side. And I think this is the reason why citizens still support this fight, despite, as you said, increased uh, energy bills, high inflation rates. It's not only due to the war, but also due to the war. It's true, but I think compared to the price that you pay, that Ukraine's pay, I think this is something which uh, we have to uh, accept. This is a price, but once again, I think uh, the fight that you uh, do and uh, your commitments are much tougher and therefore I think this is the reason why still in Europe there is such a big support for uh, the struggle of Ukraine. Before the war, uh, European Union and the European Commission they were very active uh, assisting us in building our internal institution. I mean, all the institutions still uh, were running. Uh, uh, despite of the war, uh, what kind of lessons can we 
all learn from that situation. I mean, from the point of view of the silent of the public institutions in the extreme conditions. Well, I have to say, already before the war, uh, we had a lot of contacts with the Ukrainian civil society organizations. And I have to say, um, I was fascinated that there was and there is a vibrant civil society uh, and open discussions and also disputes in Ukraine. I think this is, this is very important, that also the war hasn't changed this fundamentally. I know under martial law you have a lot of restrictions and I know that uh, also civil society organizations, I know it f also from the trade unions, are struggling with some of the measures, but there is still a dialogue, a resilience, and I think this is the reason why you have this strong resilience and still this strong uh, social cohesion in Ukraine. I don't want to, to say everything is, is perfect in this respect, not at all, not at all, mm. but we can see that you have conflicts that we also face in EU member states between civil societies, civil society organizations and governments, between social partners, this is normal. But a government has to guarantee the space for open debate, even for conflicts. And I think this is key, that you keep this for the future, and at the same time that you keep the credibility of public institutions, of the parliament, of the constitutional court, and of course the fight against corruption and the fight, this is key for me, because it's also a key priority in my manifesto, uh, the full guarantee of the rule of law. Yeah. Shrinking civil, uh, space for civil society is a phenomenon that we can see around the world. Also within the European Union, we have to fight this. We have to fight this. We have to make sure that civil society has a free space. And I think the rule of law and uh, fundamental rights are preconditions for this. Uh, I can tell you that Ukrainians appreciate very much uh, the uh, financial and economical assistance uh, we are receiving from EU countries. Uh, what kind of efforts, uh, from your point of view, should Ukraine undertake uh, to attract uh, the uh, economical activities? Because uh, for sure it is not uh, the gift uh, Europeans have given us. What kind of conditions we need to create to attract more uh, for instance, private investment for that kind of uh, uh, restoration? Well, first of all, there are already some measures which are positive and I welcome them. For example, the Donors Coordination Platform. Mm. I think it's a uh, valid, valid possibility uh, to increase credibility and trust in investments in Ukraine. You know that uh, uh, international actors such as the EU, the G7, but also financial institutions are uh, involved in this, and in the in the recons uh, and also the bank, uh, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. I think this is already an important step, and their involvement in this platform uh, ensures uh, reliability of this platform, which itself is a good signal for investors. But we have to go beyond. I know we have to go uh, beyond. So we, the ESC, the European Economic and Social Committee also uh, welcome the creation of the Ukraine facility, which is a, also another important instrument aims at supporting Ukraine's um, recovery and reconstruction uh, efforts. And in this respect, we always emphasize the crucial role of involvement of civil society. I think this will be important for the future and it has to be increased. It has to be increased. When we speak about the reconstruction of Ukraine, I think this is not only a question for uh, member states and for investors. This is also something where civil society, including social partners, should be at the table to set a framework. A clear, not only a legal framework, but also a framework, a reliable framework of uh, civil society organizations. I think this is absolutely necessary to make this period, which hopefully will come sooner than later, a success. Uh, Ukraine is trying to come closer to European standards. And what kind of tools uh, could uh, Ukraine invent and the EU could, could offer uh, to speed up that process a little bit? We know that uh, it was your idea to incorpor incorporate uh, to the uh, Economic and Social Committee some kind of Eastern European countries, especially those uh, who are 
uh, obtain uh, obtaining the candidate status. Yes. So uh, how far you move that yes. idea forward and how supportive uh, your colleagues are yes. to, to that idea? I, I would say one of the, unfortunately, one of the effects of this war, but one of the positive effects, is that we see a stronger commitment of candidate countries, and now including Ukraine, to align with European standards. Mm. And I think on the other hand side we see also that the European Union, the institutions, um, recognize that we have to speed up the process. We have to put more emphasis on this. Now it has become more dynamic, this process, due to the war uh, against, the against Ukraine. And as you said, it is one of my key priorities, one of my key priorities that the ESC, the European Economic and Social Committee, should play a key role to anticipate, to anticipate already this process. I don't want to be misunderstood. It doesn't mean that we can accelerate the accession procedure. It's not about this. But the ESC plays a key role in supporting civil society organizations in candidate countries. And I insist, I insist that our committee can go ahead and therefore, as you mentioned, my initiative to appoint already so-called honorary enlargement members from candidate countries, including Ukraine, that should be involved in our daily work. What does it mean? It means I want to involve civil society representatives from the employers' organizations, from the trade unions, from NGOs, also from Ukraine, in the drafting process of some of our key opinions. For example, if it comes uh, to initiatives aligning uh, Ukrainian standards with European standards, with the single market, but also with the European pillar of social rights, with the rule of law, with civil society, freedom of civil, civil society. All those questions are valid and I think it gives uh, an enormous added value for the ac accession procedure if we can already involve civil society representatives. Mm. They will see, they can feel already uh, the added value of debates at European level. And coming back to our committee, we are an important player in policy making, but we are not the decision maker in the narrow sense. We are an advisory body. So I think it's the best place, it's the best place to start this procedure in our committee. I'm very happy and delighted that we have a lot of support for this idea from the institutions, from European Commission, from commissioners, from the European Parliament, but also especially from the candidate countries itself. I met with the uh, employers' representatives, with trade unions, with other NGOs, also from Ukraine, who were here uh, in Brussels. They discussed this uh, idea. They want to start uh, today, if it, if it was up to them to decide. And really, I think we cannot, we cannot uh, disappoint those expectations. On the contrary, I think we should be the front runner as ESC. This is my commitment. We discussed this here in the House. I hope we will have a majority for this idea because I, I think it's a major step forward, it would be a major step forward for uh, civil society in candidate countries, also a signal of solidarity, but it would also raise the profile of our committee to be one of the front runners of, uh, of this development. Then at the beginning of the conflict you opened uh, hearts and houses for Ukrainian refugees. Right now we have already more than a year already and uh, for sure uh, the presence of more than 4 million of uh, Ukrainian refugees in Europe uh, overcome to some kind of very important social and economic factor. What impact uh, their presence had uh, for social and economic stability of EU here? And the second, uh, as Ukrainian, uh, I am very interested uh, these people to come back home to uh, take part in the restoration of my country. Mm -hmm. So that what kind of incentives could be created for them to come back with the experience they're getting here? Yes, uh, well, f first of all, I have to say I'm grateful that so many countries in Europe um, opened their borders and welcomed the refugees from Ukraine. I think it's important, it's not only the will of the governments, we can see that there's a lot of commitment on the ground of civil society organizations, by the way, of many of our members who are concretely involved in this. We had the experience of Poland, but in many other countries it was the same. We could see it in 
uh, also in Romania and Slovakia, but also in, in Germany, in Spain, everywhere across Europe. Mm. And uh, I think this is really important and shows that also on a practical, in a practical manner, civil society organizations play a crucial role uh, to facilitate uh, and to, 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 to help refugees. Now you said, and you are right, at the beginning we couldn't imagine that this horrible war will last so long. After a while, unfortunately, we recognize that it will, uh, it will be a rather long war. I think it's still our responsibility to host those uh, refugees, especially the most vulnerable in our countries, to make sure that they have equal treatment, that they are not exploited, especially women. This was a big concern of the committee and also of myself, that they could be exploited. So I think the temporary protection uh, mechanism was an important step forward. We can prolong this, but not endless. For the time being, uh, we can foresee this until 2025. But I think we have to look into uh, other solutions to integrate some of them uh, with a longer perspective. And others, I have to say, we have to facilitate or we have to bring opportunities to Ukraine to make sure that those who want to return should be able to return. Because I, I fully agree with you, uh, it would be very harmful for Ukraine if you lose all those important people um, permanently or even more people. So we need, we need, of course, still to continue with our support, more investments also in Ukraine and also to insist on reforms at the same time, which is challenging, I know, during war. But I think we can see slight improvements, also the fight against corruption, uh, the fight for for more credibility, for stronger rule of, of law. I think all these are important factors to make the Ukraine, after the war, uh, again um, a destination for, for refugees to, to come back. And of course it will be a, a huge uh, financial, financial commitment which is necessary, but not only from Europe. I think it should be a worldwide, worldwide effort to support Ukraine. And at the same time, this is also part of the story, not to forget the others. And we have Moldova and we have all the Western Balkan countries, also Turkey, which are, who are uh, candidate countries for a very long time. So this is the reason why my initiative, why my initiative is focused on all candidate countries. On all candidate countries, uh, those on Western Balkans, but also uh, Ukraine. And uh, I hope that we can contribute here to, to more coherence uh, within Europe and to to make the enlargement procedure, how long it ever takes, a success, mm. and to learn also from the from some developments in the past, from some mistakes we did in the past, when we actually were not careful enough with candidate countries to support them earlier, not only when they when they access the European Union, but much before to make their civil societies and their systems resilient and uh, to have really a vibrant uh, civil society. I think uh, we have a good chance and the starting point is, is there, but we, um, we have to continue our efforts and the committee will definitely play a key role. I myself plan also to come to Ukraine uh, as soon as possible after summer. We are in contact with your government, with your embassy, but also with civil society organizations. There it shouldn't be all, only a formal visit for a handshake. No, it should be much more. I would like to offer something, especially our initiative to involve civil society in our daily work. And I would like to present this to policymakers, but also if the security, uh, the safety situation allows, to present this idea to civil society organizations and to, to discuss it with them in Ukraine. Uh, for sure, you are familiar with the situation which we have uh, in agricultural uh, import uh, from Ukraine to five bordering countries. Now that what happened then our dream will come true and Europe, uh, Ukraine and other countries will become uh, the members uh, mm -hmm. of uh, the European Union. Mm -hmm. First of all, I condemn very strongly the behavior of Russia again to attack this and uh, to, to not to prolong this initiative, this uh, Black Sea deal uh, with regards to, to the export of, of grain. Uh, I think it shows again that 
food and hunger is used, is misused as a weapon and I strongly condemn this, I strongly condemn this and this is also an attack to our multilateral system actually. Hmm. We know that the General Secretary of the United Nations himself was very much involved, personally involved in this solution. So I see this also as a threat against our rule-based system. And I was recently in the US just last week for the high-level political forum and we discussed this. So this is one point, we have to be clear about this. I hope we can find other ways, other ways to help. Of course, only second and third best solutions, but we should help uh, Ukraine also in the interest of uh, all the people in the world who are suffering from, from hunger and who are suffering from exploding, again, increasing food prices and also food speculation in this respect. When it comes to the future, we know that integration of new member states, especially big member states with a huge agricultural system, will be a challenge, no doubt about this. And it will be painful for all of them, but I, I, I'm still convinced that we can find solutions. Uh, Anyway, we have to frame and design a new common agricultural policy after 2027 and we have to take this into consideration. This is clear, uh, but everybody has to contribute to a solution and uh, I'm quite sure if uh, there's goodwill from all sides, then we will find a solution. But once again, I think the common agricultural policy will be key after 2027. Thank you so much, sir, for your time and we will be waiting you in Kyiv. Thank you very much for this opportunity. All the best uh, for you and uh, Slava Ukraini. Gyurem Slava.